right. Well, why don't we get started? I um, Hello, for those of you that I don't know, I know a lot of you and I'm really happy to see you all. I'm Deborah Barkin, Creative Director of the Berman Museum of Art at Ursinus College, and I want to welcome you to the first Berman Conversation of 2021. Berman Conversations reflect the interdisciplinary nature of Ursinus College's liberal arts mission by pairing artists with faculty, staff, or students across the curriculum. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce Chris Graves, a Queens-based artist and publisher. In the idiom of landscape photography, Chris's work ranges from sublime images of Icelandic topography and architectures of gentrifying neighborhoods to moving spaces of memory and memorial and instances of racism within the landscape. His series, Oblique Reality, documents locations where Black people have been killed by law enforcement. His work was recently featured on the cover and in the pages of the January 2021 issue of National Geographic's Year in Pictures, which documents his road trip photographing Confederate and racist monuments and sites in the American South. His two book publishing imprints, Chris Graves Projects and Monolith, bring works by diverse artists and photographers into the hands of everyday people through limited edition books. His exhibition Testaments is currently installed in the Berman Museum of Art, features one of these images, which is also behind Chris right now um, on your right, along with his ongoing work in portraiture. Tonight, Chris will be in conversation with Ursinus Professor of Media and Communication Studies Lynn Edwards, whose research includes representations of race and gender in popular media and issues of cyberbullying and cyber predation. So please join me in welcoming Chris Graves and Lynn Edwards. What's up, y'all? Okay, I guess it's my turn. Hi. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Tonight, I guess it's night. Yeah, it's kind of night. Uh, my name is Chris Graves, and I'm a photographer from Queens, New York. A little bit of Long Island, but mostly Queens. And uh, how do I start this? I mean, I've been making landscapes and portraits for a long time now. I got out of school. I went to a school named Purchase College, which is a state university in New York, about 20 miles north of the city. Um, and I went there from 2000 to 2004. I have an undergrad degree. That's all I have. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, in college, I'll show you some other people's photographs first because they're like way better than me. So um, I, when I first got to college, I realized that I couldn't take a, a photography class until the second year because that's how this, that's how they worked it. So I kind of tricked the system by getting into like a photojournalism non-major class early. And I learned about, well, one of the first, one of the first photographers I learned about was Gordon Parks, whose photograph is here. This photograph is named American Gothic. So. This kind of formed my my kind of relationship to photography in a very specific manner. Like a, a Gordon Parks is one of the first black photographers like ever to be recognized. Um, and I love the work. So that was like my first photo book. I mean, now I've published photo books. So it's cool that that was the first one. Um, I always I also love work by a photographer named W. Eugene Smith, who is a photojournalist from the early and middle uh, 20th century. And then later on in college, I started to become really involved with like landscape photography. I had a lot of landscape professors. So I was out photographing with like a four or five view camera. I don't know, is this like a lot of photography students here or is it just like anyone in this? There are some, but okay. it's a very general group probably. Gotcha, cool. Uh, so yeah, I started to get involved with like super boring photographers like George Tice, who actually photographed New Jersey pretty consistently. Um, and I, I just love this like urban landscape, uh, urban blight type work and kind of the magic of photography um, by Hiroshi Sugimoto, who uh, this, this project is named Theaters and pretty much what he would do is set up a large, a huge camera in the back of the auditorium and let the camera stay open for the full movie to make these photographs. So I thought that was like pretty conceptually cool without, um, without being overly conceptual, I guess. It was still like a beautiful image. Um, when I was a senior in college, I think that I went to MoMA for the first time, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And um, 
saw this enormous print or one of these enormous prints by a photographer or artist named Andre Skirsky. And I was kind of blown away by the scale of it and really thought that that was a new, that was something new to me. I never thought that a photo photograph could be bigger than a painting. So it was like a, a different moment. Um, I then started to make large prints and go into debt doing it. Um, when I got to college, um, my parents paid for college, which was really great. It was a state school. I didn't choose a, a private school because my parents said I'd have to pay. So I went to the, the public school instead um, and just started to practice. I was hanging around a lot of really awesome photographers in school and the professors were really great. So I had a good time just practicing lighting and being out taking pictures pretty much all the time and just working with friends and having fun college pretty much. And I also realized that early on because my parents paid for college, I had to pay for like everything else, like food and like everything else a, a, a person needs to survive minus college. Uh, so I started to do freelance work pretty early on in my career. I mean, I was probably 18 or 19 when I started to make headshots. Um, actually, so Purchase is a conservatory school. There's a lot of actors, dancers, musicians, and actors, dancers, something else, I forgot. Musicians, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. So. Um, yeah, so I started to do headshots for people for money. I started to photograph dance performances. You can see it's pretty nasty and dirty because it's all on film. And it was, it's a weird time. It's so different now. I mean, this was only like 20, oh God, 20 years ago. It was only 20 years ago, but um, we were, I was in a dark room making all this stuff happen. I probably was losing money on all these jobs actually because of having to process film, spend hours printing and then giving prints to people as the the job like no digital images at all just like giving someone six eight by ten inch prints and then they give you money it's like something that never happens anymore anyway uh i also lived with a, um um a director so he was a, play, a playwright pretty much so i was photographing all of his performances as well so making little bits of money just trying to you know trying to survive in college when i got out of school i moved back to queens and started to photograph the development of this neighborhood named Long Island City, which I now live in, but then I was living about in the next neighborhood up. So I just take a bike ride in Queens every like, you know, for about four years straight, photographing the development of, of this of this borough. Um, I try I pretty much wanted to photograph things that that of course looked good in photographs, even though they were like kind of mundane and boring, just like the George Tice kind of photographs of of what I was learning when I was a freshman. But um, yeah, I was just getting lucky with scenes, just biking around, making photographs uh, of the neighborhood before things changed. So everything, all of these pictures, all of these works that I made here are different. They're, none of these spaces exist anymore. They're all, um, they, you, none of these scenes exist. And that was pretty much something that I thought would happen, but it happened quicker than I imagined. Um, so I'm glad that I was able to make these photographs when when they were there. I mean, that's what I do now. I kind of try to make, I try to make photographs before things change. And that's very, it's a rare occurrence. Everything's changing so much in New York City. Um, like right now, even, even now, there's a little clock tower in the middle of this picture in the bottom. There's now, there's, <laughs> this is only like four years ago. There's, there's a glass tower that's 80 stories, which is pretty much eight times the size of that building that wraps around that building now. Plus, you can't see it from this view because there's a build, there's a there's a building right where. Anyway, it's kind of crazy how much development has happened in this neighborhood over a short period of time, and um, I've just been around to photograph it. I still do photograph it, um, and then when it turns winter, I come inside and make photographs of family and friends. So this was the first kind of portrait series I did years ago named Extended Family, where I was trying to work with this uh, a view camera, which is this kind of four by five inch film plate and you get under a cloth and you have to expose in the dark. And um, and yeah, so I was photographing family and friends and over the course of like a winter, I think it was 2006, which is now a long, long time ago. Um, so I made these photographs over that winter, just trying to, trying to learn how to light. I mean, I, I bought these two very cheap strobes and wanted to learn how to become a portrait photographer pretty much while also having all of my family and friends sit for me. Um, uh, <laughs> so it's, cr it's great to look back on these portraits now because I've made about 75 of these portraits over the course of two months and I know all these people still some of them have passed away I mean the, the older people in this photographs have passed away like my grandfather and all that but 
it's cool to see like what a friend looks like 15 years ago. It's, it's awesome. So I would say if you're a photographer or if, even if you're just, you know, if you're anybody photograph your friends, so you have this kind of remembrance of what they look like in the past. Um, then in 2007, I started to work for the Guggenheim Museum, which is weird because I just left the Guggenheim today because I went back to do a freelance job in the old place that I worked 11, for 11 years. Uh, it's kind of strange, but um, so I was responsible for photographing the collection at the Guggenheim Museum, which then spread into photographing the wild artists that came through. This guy's name is Maurizio Catalan. He, he loves bananas. He's the person who put the taped banana at this art fair last year. He also made this golden toilet that he's standing in front of, a solid gold toilet, pretty funny. Um, he also made this Pinocchio that sits upside down in a pool of water at the, on the base of the museum. Um, I was responsible for making portraits of staff, photographing exhibitions as they came through. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of pieces of our collection have not have been in storage for a long time. So I worked with art handlers to try to figure out how things operated, how they'd install it uptown. This is at a studio offsite where the artists stored and where we practice pretty much. Um, and I also photographed a lot of events. This is like. I can't even explain that. But yeah, I photographed events. It was a lot of stuff, actually. I photographed parrots um, and like conservation process work. And sometimes for subway ads, like this was a subway advertisement. Um, so I worked for the Guggenheim for 11 years. Uh, I was one of the only two photographers there. I had a boss who was responsible for photographing the architecture, architecture and I photographed pretty much everything else. Um, that came through the museum. This person put a million, a million? No, a hundred thousand dollar bills on the wall for a show. So the whole room was just dollar bills and no one stole any. Amazing, congratulations for that. Um, after, <laughs> while working at the Guggenheim, most of the stuff you'll see is when I'm working at the Guggenheim, I quit in 2018, uh, but most of the stuff you see is on the side of working at the Guggenheim, other stuff that I've done. I wanted to get into publishing. I used to run a, a gallery in Brooklyn for two years, two and a half years, uh, which was photography and works on paper. We had a bunch of solo shows and I realized that selling art to rich people was super boring and I didn't want to do that. So I, I wanted to switch over to publishing. Uh, so I started with my own two books um, just because it was easier to get them in people's hands. If somebody wanted it, they could actually afford to buy it instead of never being able to afford to buy an expensive photograph. So. My first book was named Permanence, and I won't show you pictures of the inside of the book, but um, these are some pictures that, sorry, these are pictures from in the book, but not actually the book itself. Um, and this book was pretty much me going around for about 10 years photographing uh, places in the world where I had friends and could sleep on a couch, but also they had to work in the daytime. So I'd just be alone photographing their neighborhoods or their cities while they were at work pretty much. So. It was called Permanence. I got, I made about 64 photographs for this, uh, for this set. I'll show you a few now. And I was able to just go around the world in a way. I didn't go everywhere, but like a lot of Europe, Japan, Hong Kong, and Taos, New Mexico is where this was. Just kind of focusing on the landscape. Everything's pretty, I mean, there's often no people in these photographs. I mean, that's my dad. My father builds remote controls. So that's him building remote controls pretty much. Um, Puerto Rico. And the next year, um, I decided to make a matching book. So same size book, a few less pages called Discovered Missing, where I circumnavigated the Icelandic landscape. Uh, Iceland uh, is two islands kind of next to each other, but the main island has like a uh, 1600 mile or kilometer road that goes around it, route one. And it's a circle. And I just circumnavigated that circle three or four three times to make this book. What I wanted to do is make a series of work that was accessible to people. I realized that when people see beautiful, amazing landscapes, it's usually inaccessible places that you're seeing. And I wanted to show that Iceland was a place where you can just rent a cheap rent, like rent a cheap car and drive around and stay at very inexpensive Airbnb. I mean, I was staying in hospital hostels. Now it's Airbnb game, but hostels are cheap. And I was just staying on bunk beds and photographing all day. So this is a, I love this series of work. It was good for, I mean, I never seen anything like this. I was not a national park person. I still kind of am not, but um, 
at this point, I'd never seen anything like these scenes. So it was really great to, a really great change for me, um, seeing the land in this way. And then bringing it back home for people to, to kind of reflect on was cool. Um, and of course I saw the Northern Lights, which is like for, I would do nothing else. I mean, if I made no other photographs just to see the Northern Lights was kind of enough for me to have gone to Iceland. I mean, it's such a beautiful moment. I remember talking to someone in Iceland, they were like, would you fly around the world to see a rainbow? And I was like, if I never saw a rainbow, probably. I mean, anyway, so that's how Icelanders feel about uh, Northern Lights. Uh, I had a little show of this work. I mean, this doesn't look so, eh, it's a small show. That print on the left side is 40 by 80 inches. And I wanted to make these really enormous prints like those Gursky prints I showed earlier um, or Gursky print that I showed earlier. And the only way I could actually afford to make the show was to pre-sell it. So if you ever need to make a show, just get a group of people that you know that would have, that can afford to buy at least the, uh, the prints at cost so that you can make the show happen. And then after the show, you just give it to the people and then you don't have to store enormous things in your apartment. Um, after that series of work, I started to work on a series named Testament, which is now up at the museum there. And Testament for me was uh, around the same time, I think it was 2014 when we started to see a lot of black people being kind of murdered on camera by police officers for kind of the first time in history. And I was um, dealing with that emotionally and figuring out how to photograph black men as not violent or dangerous. I mean, what I saw in the history of photography was that um, black people or people of color in general uh, were um, shown as either like poor, destitute or super rich athlete, uh, actor, actress, that kind of thing, but there was no middle there was no middle for like people of color. So I just wanted to photograph the people that I knew that the people, the people that I was around and how I did that was I would surround all of these men with color changing LED light bulbs, like kind of what you see in the background of my picture. Now there's these color changing bulbs and everyone would, I would sit for, I would be the model for them and they would choose a color combination on me. And then we'd switch places and I'd photograph them with that color combination. So that's how we made these, these portraits happen. Alongside the portraits themselves, we also did a bunch of uh, video content for this work, ex uh, talking about like um, pieces of discrimination that these men have dealt with. Uh, and you can see that stuff on my website actually, or on, on YouTube if you type my name in. Um, but yeah, so we did, I did men first and then I made a book because I, I'm now just into making books. I wanted to make something super affordable. So I made this like $20 book and very limited copies and, you know, sold out. I mean, we usually sell out of the books we make through, through my presses because we don't make a lot of them. The next year um, <laughs> I made this book, Testament 2, which was uh, women, uh, because my wife said like, why are you only photographing men? I think that women are going through the same issues. And I was like, you're right. I will do that. This is actually a photograph of my sister. Um, and the same process, the, uh, the year had changed, but uh, you know, I changed the backdrop from black to, or dark gray to white and, and lights got, the bulbs got better. So they're just, they were more illuminate. Like they're, they just kind of sung a little bit more these uh, portraits of women. So it was cool to work on these. You can see these all at your school. So I won't like spend too much time looking at these right now, but um, if you haven't seen the show, check it out. This is the first show I had of the work, which is all men. This is a uh, Portland. This is a gallery named Blue Sky, which I'm now on the board of in Portland, Oregon. Um, and Portland's pretty much like 95% white. So I, I was I just wanted to fill their space with as many black faces as humanly possible. And <laughs> if I had the chance, I would just have gone up to the ceilings. But you know, I had no money for that. So uh, <laughs> I also had this show in a little gallery named Norte Mar in Brooklyn. Um, and it was the first time I got to show that one big porch to my sister. And also there's a video that I was able to play. There's this 21 minute video of men telling this story of discrimination, which is actually works out pretty well. I didn't cut it. That's probably, I didn't edit it. I just photograph or videoed it and a friend edited it and he's good at his job. So he made it all like really good. I also had this show at Bryn Mawr College kind of down the street from you guys down there. And um, it was cool to show all these black faces in this room with 
the founder of Bryn Mawr, I forgot her name on the left there, who didn't allow black people on her campus at all when they built the school. So it was kind of fun to like have, have this. Um, I then have started to play around with these grids. I think this is the first time I actually did a grid of these works like this at an art fair in New York. And then I did a, a small one for at Massachusetts College of Art, uh, which is now the MAM Museum, M-A-A-M. And then I had this large installation at the University of Tucson in Arizona or University of Arizona Tucson campus. Wait, yes, I, I yes, do have a, a quick question, I, or possibly not so quick. It's actually a question I had asked you before we started the session. Mm -hmm. Your subject matter, especially in um, Testament, is incredibly painful and, and, and soul wrenching. And yet you still seem to have this incredibly uplifting spirit. How, how are you able to, to do such difficult and challenging work and still remain this upbeat, outgoing guy? <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I think it's probably because growing up in New York City and dealing with, you know, I've, I have uncles, I have a, a father and I've have all these people around me, mom and all these people that are dealing with all these little pieces of discrimination here mm -hmm. um, all the time on a daily basis and hearing from them all the time. Every time I see people, we're having these conversations about what has happened in the last week or two weeks because it's just con constant. The problems are mm -hmm. constant. So I think just hearing all of this from the time I was three years old until forever has numbed me to how painful some situations get maybe mm -hmm. that's that's probably the best way for me to answer this like I I've heard it all you'd I would be shocked if you told me something that I've never heard before from a family member that happened to them so mm -hmm. um so yeah that's how I feel about it I just kind of move move through all right can I ask a follow-up question unless somebody else hey, has a question as much as you want cool okay so one of the other things I shared with you before we started is that your your artwork really just like reaches into my heart and breaks it because like you like your uncles I too have dealt with racism and my family has dealt with it and I think because of some of the painful things that have happened and that are happening I tend to avoid art or work that makes me feel the way yours makes me feel it's, it's as if art hurts do you yeah. think that that is one of the goals of art to to hurt to heal to wake people up like how do you see it well, i think that it should be <laughs> i don't think that it is <laughs> i think that there's a lot of artists that do you know they don't really focus on the kind of work that's introspective in mm -hmm. a way so for me i realize that there's like not so much time on this earth for me to figure out like some work that people can actually uh relate to mm -hmm. and and that's why I do this work pretty much. Hi, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I then started, I did this work with uh, um, Huffington Post last year where we photographed these uh, more popular or famous people that are also running our nonprofit organizations or they're, you know, they're um, working uh, to help people as well as their like main jobs. So you may know Shangela, they just had a show on, I think, HBO last year, which is really cool. Danielle Brooks in the bottom right is from Orange is the New Black. So it was really kind of cool to hang, like, have a moment to, to speak to these people and have them choose their own colors too. I mean, I think that was like the most fun to like have some popular famous person in a room for like, I think 10 minutes and have them choose colors over and over again until they were happy. It's kind of interesting. Some people hated it, uh, I think, but most people had a good time with it at least. And it's definitely the only photo shoot that they'll ever have like that. I don't think anybody else is going to ask them for any opinions or how there no one, no other photographer is really giving agency in a way when you're seeing them on in magazines. So I thought that it was important for them to like at least have a moment once to have a photo shoot where they could choose something that was going on inside. Um, and I just continue on with these these portraits, trying to figure out new ways to um, new ways to make these make these work. Um, uh, besides all that stuff, I am a freelance photographer here in New York. I work with a company named the Architectural League, which I now am on the board for too. And I did this job named Bronx Contours, where 
I went around the Bronx photographing why it was different than every other part of New York City, meaning most of New York City was flattened to make a gridded system and like Queens, Brooklyn and Manhattan and the Bronx was not flattened. So they have these kind of wonky streets and staircases that are actual streets like 177th Street is a staircase um, and it has apartment buildings on it, but it's like a staircase. Um, this is actually the top of, I don't know whoever saw the Joker movie, but if you ever see it again, this is the top of that same staircase. So you can like <laughs> kind of recognize at least those light poles. Um, but yeah, because these jobs didn't, you know, I, I, this job paid me like $500, I think. And I wanted to do it in a day because they didn't give me a time limit. They were just like, shoot this job for $500. And I was like, I'll do it in one day, one really gray, beautiful, disgustingly gray day in the Bronx. And I walked pretty much for about 24 miles that one day to make these photographs. So I didn't have to like go back. And my family's from the Bronx. So it was cool. I was randomly walking on random streets and would pass. Oh yeah, this is my grandma's house. I did not know that I was here, but now I know how it connects to everything else. So if you ask me a question about the Bronx, I know, I know the answer. I know where you can see chickens running in the middle of streets next to train stations. <laughs> it's like crazy. Anyhow, I do a lot of freelance work for a company named CubeSmart. If you ever see these, I get to photograph them, but I also have to like manipulate them, right? Cause they're blues and you can't get blue and red to be the same every time. So I work with someone that makes them all the same colors. I also got hired to photograph every police precinct in New York city. That was a fun one. I think it took them two years to find a piece of paper from the police department so that I would feel safe enough to actually put a humongous tripod in front of 77 police precincts in New York City to photograph. Um, but yeah, it worked out. I did this, I was working when I, I was still had a day job then. So every weekend of a month and a half, I went out and made photographs all day of these police precincts. And then of course went back to work on the weekdays. Um, I make my own books and this was, this started as a job for Vanity Fair, and I called it Oblique Reality. This is eight locations where Black people were killed by police officers across America. And I, what I want to do again is take it back to that George Tice moment where we're, we're seeing a very mundane landscape. And like, what is this landscape? What does it mean? Um, you know, someone was murdered here. Michael Brown was murdered here. And I wanted to show you that these scenes exist everywhere. I mean, this doesn't have to be a dangerous location. These aren't dangerous places. These are just places. And these pla these things are happening everywhere is why I made these photographs the way that I made them. Um, this is in Staten Island where Eric Garner was choked. There's always a, um, a memorial, like you can see this little memorial here. There's always a memorial. So South Carolina did not have a memorial. That was on private property. But um, yeah, so I made eight of these and made them into this oversized book. They're too far for me to grab right now. But they're, they open up to being a 20 by 24 inch print. And that's what I was, that's what I was going for with this series, Baltimore. This is in Ohio where, um, oh my gosh, what's his name? So many names. I mean, it's weird. I mean, I didn't think I'd be doing all this work like this in my life, but it seemed like somebody had to. Um, <laughs> this is at a school named, uh, what was this school called? Petty School. The Petty School outside of Princeton. A uh, very opulent uh, high school, uh, um, a boarding school. I'm actually sure if it's a boarding school um, in New Jersey where I got to have this show. This is the first time I showed both works, the portraits as well as the landscapes. And what I wanted to do with the landscapes at night is not light them. So the portraits stay very bright as the landscapes are very low to the ground and unlit so that you'd have to confront both of these realities. I also worked uh, for an organization named the Equal Justice Initiative, which runs out of Montgomery, Alabama. And they were working on a project named Lynching in America. They sent me to Ellisville, Mississippi to photograph this tree where a man was lynched in 1919, one of over 4,500, I think, official lynchings that occurred in the South during the Jim Crow era. And I went there to photograph the location where this happened. And then I flew out to Los Angeles to photograph uh, his descendants. Uh, the woman on the right, her name is Mamie Kirkland. When I photographed her four or five years ago now, she was 108. She died last year. Um, but I mean, she was awesome. She was walking around talking to me like she was there. She was cool. And we had a good time and we made some good photographs of her. Um, 
and it was a really cool moment for me because I don't think I'd never met an 108 year old before for sure. I mean, and, and to have, to have someone just walk up to you and just start having a conversation about the past um, was pretty amazing. Um, so I did that. And now what I'm working on now, and I'll end it here, is a two, a two book series named Truth and Ruin, I think is going to be the name of it. It's going to come out later this year. And the first book is going to be named Privileged Mediocrity. And it's going to deal with um, the American landscape and the problems within that American landscape, as well as the people stuck um, within that landscape. So we're talking about racism, um, just strange, strange racism in the American landscape, like Confederate monument work, uh, the discre the the dis the realities of people um, in this country. You know, of course, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in this book, actually, and I hope that it comes together in the right way. We're talking about like um, infrastructure problems and climate change as well. Um, yeah, gentrification and racism in the landscape, like I said, and the people suck within it. And the second part of that book will be called latency, um, which is pretty much another word for the, a delay. And um, this work will focus on, last year I photographed for National Geographic a few times. I actually was on the road for a month photographing different scenes uh, of like different Confederate monuments in the South. So I went around the South, eight states in the South for a month photographing every Confederate monument I could find. Um, these, mo most of these that you're seeing with the paint on them are from Richmond, Virginia. And then I went to seven other states to make this work happen. I've seen some crazy things. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've seen some crazy stuff. So this work will be a part of a larger book, which deals with um, the latency, which is like the catching up with history, which is what I feel all this graffiti is on these sculptures, as well as there's going to be a 32 page middle, which has a um, archive of every Confederate monument that I photographed along the way. So that's, I think I photographed about 300 races sites, mostly Confederate monuments, and then yeah, I, I photographed a lot over the course of those days. Um, yeah, and then I was lucky enough to get the cover of the January issue of National Geographic for one of the photographs. And I have a 24 page spread in the um, February issue. So yeah, that's all I'll say. That's all I got. Thanks for listening to all that. I'll start and feel free to cut me off if anyone else has a question. I know I thought there was one in the chat, but what was that moment like when National Geographic called you and said, you're going to be our cover? I mean, was it thrilling? Was it a shock? Did you know it was coming? Um, no, I didn't know it was coming. And they didn't actually tell me that I would definitely have a cover. They told me that we were considering this image for the cover. And I was like, yeah, okay, sounds good. Let me know. I mean, it was not like, oh my God, I can't, this is going to be amazing. This is like, no, I didn't have any of that because they were like, maybe this happens, maybe it doesn't. So I think mm -hmm. that was, but I was like, I'm glad that they're considering it because I, you know, the cover of National Geographic is never, uh, it's not usually as political as I guess that picture could be cons like perceived as. So mm -hmm. I was happy that they went with it. I mean, of course, I think it was the best picture of last year too. So what? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm glad they used it. I'm glad that, um, but I'm more happy that we were able to put together a 24 page story of um, for the February issue, because that's really in depth. There's a lot of information in there and it has a beautiful written section mm -hmm. um, and I didn't write it. So that's why it's, that's why it's good. Thank you. I can read it. Yes, there is a question. What was the transition from film to digital like for you? Oh my gosh, that was a long time ago. I mean, I think that it was a, it was a mix. It wasn't like I stopped making film works and then went to digital. I think that I was always both and I still still use a four or five, but very rarely. Um, so I don't know, the transition was very slow and I was probably the first person in my school to print digitally from negatives. I think I was the first person to do that around 2000. Um, so I was always interested in digital technology. I mean, I've had a computer in my room since I was nine years old. So I was really, that's where I, I loved it. I've been a computer person. So, and you know, for now, from like now, um, I would say that digital is surpassed. 
not surpassed. It's different. They're all like, it's all art, but digital cameras are amazing. I mean, you can photograph handheld at night and see stars sharply. That's something that you can never get away with on film. So there's just different, um, they're, they're different things really. Uh, but I would say like, you know, just shoot. It doesn't matter if you're shooting film or digital, that, that doesn't matter at all. That's not the point. That, I mean, that's not my point. I think that is for some people, they love the process of being in a dark room or uh, like shooting on film, but like, I am over that. I don't want to be in the dark room anymore. I just want to make the work, see it and then get it out there. I had a follow-up question um, to some of your shots in the more urban settings in New York, um, not just the hilly portions of Queens, but you managed to get most of your, to take most of your portraits or most of your photos when the streets are empty. Is that intentional? Because when I compare those images to your images of Iceland, like Iceland and empty streets is beautiful. Mm -hmm. When I see it in America, it just, it strikes me as, as abandoned um, yeah. or as if people are fearful to come out there or just like, how did you manage to do that? Intentional? What? I mean, where I'm photographing is not really overly populated. So I can always wait out people. <laughs> um, so that's it. I mean, no, nobody's on these streets. I mean, people mm -hmm. are Humanity exists on subway lines and bus lines. If you're not on those, then you're probably going to find clear streets. I mean, if you walked, if anyone, I imagine where you guys live now, if you walked one mile on your street, you're probably not going to pass many people, right? I mean, and I think that in New York City, you're not going to get away with not passing any people, but there will be some moments where you can walk two blocks and not see a soul. So that's Queens. I mean, it's not overpopulated. Like New York City is just populated. Like Manhattan is populated. Some of Brooklyn is populated, but here, not so much. It's getting there. I mean, there's like a thousand new buildings down the block, but still you can pick your times. If it's daytime and it's three blocks away from where people live, you're not gonna see anybody. Another question, have you been able to share your work with communities that might not have easy access to museums and galleries? Well, I would hope that, you know, I exist online so you can always find all of my, most of my newest work on the internet for free if you have a computer. Uh, so that's one. Uh, shows are given. They're not like, I don't have any people, people ask me to show and I'm happy to. And whenever I'm asked to show something, I usually say yes. So that's one way to get out there. But I don't, I, I haven't been, in, I, I don't know how to um, do it any other way. Like I don't, know how to find opportunities for myself to show in places that I wouldn't normally be, I guess. I've always, I always have to be asked. I'm asked for these things. So they, so, the, so that's how it works really. Early on in showing your work, um, you were showing the images in Iceland and, and I was struck by the position that your camera must have been in to get these images. Were you using drones? Were you standing on mountains? How did you do this? All of that Iceland work was within a half mile of the car. Uh, and it was never up a mountain, not really. I mean, none of the work you saw was up a mountain, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so everything's pretty easy. I mean, my parents, an 80 year old, anyone could walk to the scenes that I was at mm -hmm. um, from their car. So I did that on purpose uh, because I definitely have gone on like a 14 mile hike in Glacier National Park. And that's still a totally different experience versus just being on the road in Iceland. I mean, every mm -hmm. 20 minutes in Iceland, the landscape changes. I, I suggest everyone see it at least once. I mean, 20 minutes out of the city, you're seeing like a glacier. 20 minutes after that, you're seeing the continental shift. 20 minutes after that, you're seeing the biggest waterfall you've ever seen. And then after that, you're seeing a, a volcano crater. And then 20 minutes after that, you're seeing a waterfall you can walk under. And then one mm -hmm. you can walk over. And then you're seeing ice on the beach coming down from glaciers. I mean, this is all within two hours. It's a crazy place. So, but it's all kind of accessible, which is, makes mm -hmm. it really great. Yeah. Do you remember what time of day you visited the Northern Lights to be able to get like a, such a clear photo? Cause I think it's not always as visible, right? Uh, yeah, you have to be lucky. You have to be really lucky. I, I, if you go to, if you're, I think the best time I've gone to Iceland two times in March and one time in November. And November, I didn't see the Northern, oh, two times in November, two times in March. The two Novembers, not much Northern Light activity. 
the march, the two marches have been really big on Northern Lights. I think that what you're, there's an Aurora forecast. So I have like three Aurora forecast finders linked on, you know, like I just have, you can type in Aurora forecast and you'll see three of them. So you have to time it. I mean, you can look back at old years and see like what was happening, but usually it has to be night and nights are very long in Iceland. I mean, usually in March you're getting sunlight between like 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. So you're working with a ton of night. I would say that Northern Lights usually come out around midnight, 1 a.m. and then they stay around for an hour, two, three, but you have to be somewhere clear. So that means that you have to probably drive around to find a clearing in the sky to see the Northern Lights sometimes. Like we were on the south of Iceland and me and my, my wife and I were staying at a hotel that was being managed by the person who was also our waiter and then was also a sheep herder in the summertime up the mountain in the back of the hotel. And he was like, he was looking at the cloudiest sky I've ever seen in my life. And he said, if you drive 20 miles to the West and stop your car, you'll probably see Northern Lights. And I was like, all right. And we did it and we saw Northern Lights for the first time. So, you know, some people know, some, <laughs> it's like, it happens. Um, but yeah, midnight to 2 a.m., get a snowsuit and just walk around Iceland. Are there any other locations that you that you dream of shooting or that you plan to shoot in the future? My friends, well, the, a, a group of Hawaiians have uh, become a sovereign nation on Oahu. They have 100 acres that they've leased from the government. So I'm going to go photograph that in a few weeks um, and just see what that see what building a country is like. You know, that's something I would, would like to know about. And then uh, I'm going to I'm going to photograph uh, hopefully the rebirth of the California wildfires, take three or four fires in, in particular and photograph the, re the redevelopment that's happening there, if there is any, because um, sometimes they hit people of color in communities. And I want to see what the difference between like the rebirth of a people of color community versus like not. Um, mm -hmm. So that, and I also want, I mean, I want to go to the Maldives. If anybody can find me a grant to go to the Maldives and photograph the separation between how beautiful it is versus how terrible their culture is then that would be like something i want to photograph as well i can i can just list a thousand things i, I want to photograph many things but those things are those things i like in my mind i don't know if i'll be mm -hmm. able to go to the maldives but um right. yeah japan i'd like to see that again i don't think i can ever go to china again that got really weird <laughs> so not weird is the the safe word and um I've never been to South America. I've never been to Africa. I've never been to Australia. I've, I have a lot of places that I want to see. Mm -hmm. Chris, there's another question in the chat. I noticed the General Lee Monument in Richmond where I used to live. This must have been an incredible controversy in Virginia. Can you comment on that? Yeah, it's still up. So it definitely is a co controversy. Every other Confederate monument besides one named AP Hill which is also a grave site, which they're having a problem with. Actually, let me talk about this AP Hill guy. AP Hill, he's outside of, um, he's in Richmond also. He, he's buried standing up inside of a circle street. Like there's a street circle and he's in the middle, this big thing, obelisk, and he is buried standing up inside of it. And they don't know how to move that. Anyway, but besides that, all of the other monuments in Richmond have either been torn down by angry mobs or not even angry mobs, just mobs of people, or uh, taken down by the city. General Lee's is pretty big. There's a controversy in it um, about it being taken down because it's still owned privately or something. I don't know how that works, but yeah, it's tumultuous down there. And I'd love to see it gone. I, I hope that it goes sooner than later, but I doubt that it will because it's the South. Can you talk about your process of biking and photographing is another question. I definitely don't bike and photograph at the same exact time, but uh, it was just me. I lived in Astoria, which is like right under the Triborough Bridge, which I, I don't know if it's still named that. I think it's something else now, but I would just get on my bike. I bought a nice used bike on Craigslist and I still use it to this day and bike around for eight to 10 miles and streets that I've never been on before and stop when I see something interesting. That was it. Pretty simple, like a camera around my, my neck and a and a bike and like four dollars for some pizza at some strange pizza place somewhere i think that was my days but i was also like 23 years old when i started doing that so 
I had, you know, yeah, that was it. I think that I still do that sometimes, but I need to get back on a bike more. Once it's warm, it seems like it's getting there. And then I'll just be in Queens, just biking around. Last summer I was gone because of the pandemic. So I didn't get to like spend time doing nothing in New York. It was like just work or not work. It was, I was on Cape Cod. My wife has a family house there. So I wasn't able to bike around as much, but this year is a bike year. I got to start photographing this neighborhood before it's completely made of glass. And there's a landscape photography question. You can plan ahead for time of day with landscapes, but how much do you try to plan ahead for the quality of light, sun, cloud, or other? And do you just take what you get when you're on location? I guess that depends on what you want to photograph. I mean, for me, if I'm photographing Queens, I know the location, I know when the light is going to be best. So I'll go back and photograph it when light is best. Uh, when I'm on the road, like with National Geographic, I'm pretty much, we have, we had 24 days on one of the trips and I, we had 3,500 miles to cover. So we pretty much made a weird ass map and we had to stick to it. Sometimes there'd be an extra racist monument along the way that we'd kind of stumble across, which is also weird. But besides that, um, we would just, um, we would just go. There was no light. I, I was unconcerned with the light at the moment. It was, we were lucky that it didn't rain one time that, for 24 days. So I think that that was good enough for us. With gray sun or not, or like, it could, we had to make it work. <laughs> Um, and because I photograph a lot on scene, like I'm photographing, I pretty much circumnavigate anything I'm photographing to make every possible scenario so that I can go back later and look at them and try to figure out which one's best. So that's what I do with all these things, kind of uh, focus at, on scene. I just focus on making as many photographs as possible, coming back home and doing the editing then. Like doing the editing on location is a little bit more difficult, but I don't know, it's, let me see your question again. No, I couldn't plan for any of the stuff when I'm on a day job, but when I'm not on a day job, I do plan to never be out when it's too sunny or um, when it's too dark. I love a light gray. If you could give me a light gray with a hint of sunlight that makes a tiny shadow on buildings, I'll take that any day. I have a question for you, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, as I was involved in um, installing your exhibition and oh, a lot- thank you. Um, you know, most people on, on the call haven't yet had a chance to, an opportunity to see the exhibition, but one of the things that was so, is so striking about the exhibition is that your work, the work is literally in visual conversation and sometimes even verbal conversation with, with the works with one another. In the case of your video, installate your video, you've got two photographs where the gazes of the people being pictured are actually watching the video. And mm -hmm. in the Testament project, um, the gazes are really interesting at one another and at the viewer. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, that dialogue that happens between the work in when it's installed. Well, I think, you know, every installation is kind of different because you're always given a kind of different structure of how a place can operate. So with this particular show, we had two walls to work with and the third wall came later. I think you just found a place for that picture actually somewhere else. But like we had two walls to work with and I was like, one can be the grid of portraits because nothing else should be on that wall. It should just be the, that grid. And the other space was more of a question, like how do we break it ap apart from just being that Testament project work? Um, can we bring in some other like portraits or landscapes to kind of to to make sense of what we're seeing or to uh, to bring some like kind of out outer outside beauty to the scenes? I don't know. Um, but with the with that uh, video, it's been such a dynamic video, and that's actually my mother speaking. So she's that, the, my mom is the person who's speaking in that video. So if you ever listen to it for four minutes. That is my mother telling a story that I've heard when I was six years old, you know? So, and I was at those places. I mean, I would be at those offices with her when that was happening too. So, um, this, I mean, I'm just glad that, thank you for having the show first off. Thank you so much for like showing that work. And for this show, I was like, I've never done that before. So like, it's new. If it works, I'm, I'm glad. So <laughs> I'm just happy that it works really. Um, yeah. But I did want to focus, I did want those people looking in. Like I wanted the two portraits to like kind of look in on that video so that maybe you would too. And that's how we set it up. 
the dark walls i can't wait to see those dark gray walls because thank you for painting i mean that those portraits like the 80 portrait grid on those that dark wall was like really beautiful anaya you got your hand up oh yeah i was also going to ask um what photos do you think have a stronger emotional response for you like looking at the racist monument to like the photos that you took in Mississippi as opposed to like the empty la uh, landscapes of New York or like the Northern Lights. I don't know, they all like generate a pretty, like very different emotional responses for me. So I was wondering from your point of view as the photographer, what that meant for you. Yeah, I think they all mean something different when they're being made. I mean, when I see a picture for the first time or like am newly dealing with an issue, um, it feels different. It's like, oh my God, I think that this actually works. I think that people will respond to this or at least be able to see where I'm coming from. Um, but at a point I've seen those images a thousand times and they're, I'm totally numb to it at this point. Like I know which ones have worked and I know which ones don't work. And that doesn't mean I won't show them. If I like them, I'm gonna show them anyway, even if I know that the portrait is not like no one's, bought it or no one like has ever mentioned liking it like I mean I, I'll still show it so it's a mix I mean of course I'm more emotional about the pictures that are family that's like you know that happens I mean there's a you know if you see that wall at the gallery there's going to be like there's multiple same people right like so you'll see people in different colors there's like all of that wall is like multiple so there's never just one of a person kind of so you know I have cousins that came up from Virginia to to get photographed or people that I hadn't seen in 10 years from college or cousins that I haven't seen in 15 years. And like those people are involved too. So I guess it all just comes together and I'm just happy that I got to like see those people <laughs> and make the work with them and collaborate with them in a way that was more than just me making photographs of them. They really did have, without them being a part of making the photograph, uh, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be, it would never have happened. So for me, like that stuff is really cool. Like the portrait stuff and landscapes. I just get happy by seeing that stuff. I mean, when you're in the scenes, it's a little emotional, I guess, because you're trying not to get into trouble. I mean, I was in a lot of places where my, like I had an assistant who was driving who would keep the car running. <laughs> so like, cause he was like, okay, this is not the best place. You can go out and photograph, I'll watch you. And then if anything happens, run to the car, you know, like that kind of stuff. So it, that happens. Um, <laughs> But at a point, you just become numb to it. I mean, we got stopped by a cop in West Virginia. I didn't get stopped by a cop. My friend got stopped by a cop because he was photographing a backyard in West Virginia. And this cop was like, that's my family's backyard. What are you doing? I was like, oh, we're going to jail, man. And um, <laughs> we didn't go to jail because we, because, because I, you know, we played it smart and showed them press passes. And it was weird. That was a weird moment. I kind of forgot that happened until just now. Yeah, so stuff like that happens too. Um, <laughs> so it's um, it's all over the place. But again, like I always hope for the best and so far so good. I mean, at some point, maybe not, but right now it seems okay. I love making them and I'm glad that people like them, but you know, I, hopefully I can affect some sort of positive change with the work. That's all I can hope for. And I think that tonight you've affected all of us here and that your work will continue to um, affect us moving forward. And as with the pandemic, we are beginning slowly to ease up on restrictions and more and more people will be able to access the exhibition. At the moment right now, our sinus students can um, make appointments on break days to come see the exhibition and that's going to slowly change as we move forward. So I think that, you know, the opportunity for you to affect all of us here is ongoing. Awesome. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Thank you, Chris, so much. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, we have two upcoming events in April that I just want to quickly mention on April 8th, we're having a special collaboration with the James Michener Art Museum. Uh, it's a panel discussion called Critical Eye, the Camera as a Social Justice Tool. And this is a panel discussion with Ursinus Emeritus Professor of Photography, Donald Camp and artist Ed Eckstein and Ada Trillo. And this will be moderated by the Michener curator, Laura Turner-Igo and Rob Varney, who's a 2020 graduate of Ursinus. 
in studio art. And then on April 21st, a Berman conversation featuring artist Shannon Colas, whose multimedia exhibition Strata is currently installed in the museum. She will be in conversation with Ursina student Kristen Cooney, who co-curated Strata along with Justin Mitchell and Katie Sanfield as part of the Museum Studies Curatorial Practices Seminar. So please stay tuned for those events. Again, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you everyone who took time out of their schedules to come and be with us tonight. Yeah, thanks y'all. Yay, thank you. Take care everyone. Bye.